Good morning. How is everybody? We're glad that you are here. Understand part of the ceiling may have come down during the week and whoever got it up, thank you. Thank you so much because there's nothing left here so you never know what would have happened. And so uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you for taking care of, care of that for us. So I'm going to preach a message called The Kingdom is at Hand. And before I do that, I have a something, I want to tell you something that happened to me this last week. So last Thursday, I was having like a really, really bad day. Anybody ever, ever just have a bad day? So this last Thursday, I was having a really, really bad day. And, and Gloria comes up to comfort me and she goes, if you think today is bad, wait for two more days. And, and, and I ask why? And she goes, because then it will be Saturday. Do you remember that conversation? I didn't think you would. <laughs> yeah, did you see her dragging me to the laundry? Yeah, that was her, yeah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are such a good God, and we love you today, and we cannot wait to hear what you have to share with us today through your word. And so I ask your Holy Spirit to just begin to move across this congregation today, anoint my lips to say what I need to say, and anoint our ears to hear what we need to hear today. And let us, let us remember what you did for us when you died on the cross as we take communion in just a little bit. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I was praying this last week about um, this week's message, and this verse kept coming to me, and it kept coming to my mind, because I feel like we really are living in a time when we need to hear from God. And, and, and I want to say this to you, that I, I really believe that it's important for me to bring you messages that you can know for sure that I have heard from God and in turn through the messages we all will hear from him. We live in a day and age when we need to hear from God. We need to hear him speaking to us. And I think we're also living in a day and age when we need to get rid of the fluff, you know, and we need to just get to the meat of what God is saying to us and, um, and what we, what we need to know. So, I was thinking about this verse, and it says that Jesus preached. It starts off, we'll get there in just a bit. We'll get to the verse in a bit. I'm not there yet. But it says that Jesus preached. And and so then I started thinking about preaching. And, And another word for preaching is to proclaim. That's literally what it means, is to proclaim. Proclaiming is not me giving my opinion. I had, a, I had a guy come to me in my last church and he goes, Pastor, I love, I love the singing, I love the worship time, I love the praying, uh, I, I like all that, but I don't like the part where you're telling me what to do. <laughs> and it's like, well, it's not my opinion, what I'm trying to share with you, it's a proclamation of what God is saying to us. And so it's not my, pro, proclaiming is when we in a public way say a message that is a fact. For instance, here's an easy one. So Abraham Lincoln gave the Emancipation Proclamation. He, was, he wasn't giving his opinion. He was telling the nation, this is how it's going to be. He wasn't making a prediction. He wasn't giving his opinion. He was giving an authoritative statement of fact. So when we read that Jesus preached, he was not giving his opinion, he was giving a proclamation, he was giving an authoritative statement of fact. Now people can either choose to accept it, or they can choose to reject it, but nevertheless, it is the truth, it is the fact. So here's the verse, it's Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, and here's what it says. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So now, before we get into this verse, let me just um, give you a little little bit of background uh, on it, if that's okay. So 
when you read through this, you will find that Jesus is at the very beginning of his public ministry. In fact, he still hasn't called the 12 disciples, okay? So it's just him, all right? He's just returned from 40 days in the wilderness and had gone through the, you know, the three, tem- three different temptations. And he, was, he finds himself in his hometown of Nazareth when he heard that John the Baptist had been arrested. And then he left Nazareth and he went to the little fishing village of Capernaum, okay? In fact, why don't, why don't we go back a few verses? Let's go back to verse 12 and let's take a look at this and then we'll, it takes us right down into that verse that I already shared with you. So in verse 12 it says, now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled. So he went there for a reason, so that it would be fulfilled by Isaiah the prophet, saying the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness had seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. And from that time, it says, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here's the thing. When Jesus was going to speak, nobody, there was nobody who had to, um, there was nobody who had to un- try to figure out what he was going to say. He had his, he had his message. So Jesus, no, when Jesus came in and he was going to share, nobody had to guess what he was going to say. They knew what the message was. There was never any question what he's going to say. I think it's interesting that when you go back to the Bible, see, we pastors nowadays, you know, we preach 52 Sundays and then Wednesday nights. When I first started in pastoring, we had 52 Sunday mornings, 52 Sunday nights, and then we had Wednesday night. And so we were like coming up with like 150 some messages over, over a year's a year's time. I always like that little thing where we had to tell them how many times we preached the last year, and it was like 150 sometimes, you know. And so, um, and, and now of course it's it's mostly Sunday morning. And so, but we feel the need that every week we need to bring you something new, that something maybe that you haven't heard. And so every week, Jesus didn't worry about that. He had one message. It says from that time he began to preach. And what did he begin to preach? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So whenever Jesus was preaching to you, you knew exactly what he was going to say. It was clear. There was no if, ands, or buts. You knew what the message was. There was never any question about what it was going to be. So when people was preaching, you immediately knew where he stood. He opened his mouth, and there was never any doubt when the light broke and the, light, and the light dawned, the topic was clear as could be. It was the, as a matter of fact, here's something interesting. It was the exact same message of John the Baptist. If you go back to chapter 3 and verse 2, John said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And here Jesus was saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at, at hand. And by the way, just as a little aside, the early church they had one sermon too, and it was Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. I wonder how much better off we would be if we would just, instead of trying to come up with all these flashy things that we try to do in our sermons, and I'm including myself in this, I wonder what would happen is if we would just do what the church did and just begin to preach the message that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. So Jesus had this Message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now there are two things. The first part of his message is repent. The second part of his message was why should I repent? It's repent, why? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what's the significance of this? And Jesus said the darkness is upon you because the darkness is in you. For 400 years before Jesus came, they hadn't heard from God. Israel had not heard anything from God. And then all of a sudden, at the end of 400 years, 
you have John the Baptist jumps up and starts preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and then Jesus saying the same message. And Jesus is saying, the problem is, it wasn't that the world is dark, it's because the darkness is in each one of you. And the word repent is a word that you usually only hear in the church. Well, what does it mean to repent? Well, I want to tell you this before we get into that, that sin has put you on a path towards death. Matter of fact, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12 and Proverbs 16 verse 25 both are exactly the same verse. Did you know that? Exactly the same verse. So here's my thinking. If the Bible said something twice, it, it means this is something we need to know. For instance, if my mom told me it was time to take the trash out, she would say it once, and then she would say it again, and then I knew the second time I could hear her. Magically, I could hear her that second time. The Bible is saying the same exact verse two times. You know what that tells me? We should probably pay attention to it. Here's what it says, Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. I could probably preach couple hours just on what that said, especially with what we're going through right now. We have all these people trying to tell us what's right and what we need to do. We have a ton of people talking to us. Here's what you need to do. Matter of fact, I'll edit this out of the YouTube thing. You know what? How many of you have seen all the videos where people go into a store without a mask on and somebody starts yelling at them? We got all kinds of people telling us what to do. And none of them have the credentials. And even the people who have the credentials really don't know what they're talking about. And so the Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, but there's a problem with it. Its end is the way of death. So we're headed towards death, which means we need to turn around. If you're on the road to death, you probably should turn around. It means, it means we should change our life. It, it, there's a better word for it. It says converted. It means a total change. It's more than sorrow. It's that you have to change your life. You have to change your purpose. You, have to, you change your opinion. You change your direction. It's an inner change of the heart leading to an outward change of the life. I'm going to say something really controversial here, okay? Are you ready for this? When you get saved and you become a Christian, your life will change. Your opinions will change. Your attitude will change. Hopefully for some of us, our personalities change. And we start becoming more and more like Jesus as the Holy Spirit leads us. So there's a better word for this than repent. It's converted. You need to convert. You need to, it's a radical change. Something radical needs to change in your life. So I was telling Gloria this earlier in the week. I don't remember why, but we were talking about the word repent. I was probably in trouble and I probably needed to repent. And I told her, that's weird, because I was just, I was just writing about this, and, it, it, and here's what I realized about the word repent. The word repent doesn't mean swerve. It doesn't mean keep going in the same direction and just go around. It means you need to stop, and you need to... It doesn't even mean to turn left or turn right. When it says repent, it literally means you have to turn 180 degrees. You have to turn around in the opposite way. So no swerving, no turning, no turning left, no turning right. You have to turn around and face the other way. John the Baptist preached it. Jesus preached it. And this is the message of the gospel, to repent. You cannot come to Jesus apart from repentance. And here's the thing. Jesus in the world are two opposites. We used to sing a song, I have decided to follow Jesus. You remember that song? You remember the one verse? The world, the cross before me, 
the world behind me. Actually, I have a cross behind me on that screen. You can't see it, but the cross before me, the world behind me. Not, not to, not take a left turn, not take a right turn. Don't try to swerve. You got to turn around. Both totally opposite directions. And Jesus said, and, and so you can't come to him. And here's the thing. The world says, go this way. And Jesus says, go this way. I'm pointing this way because that's where the cross is. You're either going to go one way or the other. You see, some people are just thinking they can swerve a little bit. I'm not really going to change much in my life. I'm going to say I'm a Christian. I'm going to tell people I'm a Christian. I'm going to believe, but I'm just going to take a little swerve. It's not going to last, right? Or some people will go, you know what? Uh, they, they do half of the turn, and they turn to the left, but the cross is still that way. You see what I'm saying this morning? You've got to turn around. You're either going one way or the other. Repentance is on the path of acknowledging the truth. Matter of fact, Peter preached it on the day of Pentecost. The very first sermon that Peter ever preached that was heard in the church after Jesus was gone is to repent and be baptized. Turn around and be baptized. As a matter of fact, this is just coming to me as I'm preaching this, and it's saying repent, and then Peter says be baptized, which means you have to literally die. That's what baptism, well, it's not literally dying, but you, you have to be dunked under the water to signify that you're dead and that you're coming up a new person. So Peter's saying you've got to change the direction in your life, and when you do that, you, by the way, you need to come to us and let us dunk you underwater so everybody knows that you're changing direction. You've got to turn around. That's the bottom. Can I just preach it this morning? You've got to turn around. You're going the wrong direction. You have to change your whole life in order to come to Christ. See, we got too many people in the church, they've only swerved, or they've only turned to the left, or they've only turned to the right, instead of turning around. And I wish I had that screen up so you could see the cross. I need, we need our cross back, don't we? So that's what Jesus meant by repent. And then he comes to the second part, which is, why? Why do I have to repent? Well, the Bible says twice, with exactly the same words, there is a way that seems right to the man, but its way leads to what? Death. Jesus gives the reason why you've got to repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus was saying this, that the Jews had been waiting for thousands of years for the Messiah to come and set up his kingdom. Matter of fact, the disciples, remember, if you read about the disciples, they always had a problem with the kingdom thing, didn't they? They always, they always Jesus, when's the kingdom going to come? Or, or they would go, what am I going to be in the kingdom? You know, the, Pete, John and, James and John are fighting over who's going to have the seat next to Jesus in the kingdom. You know, stuff like that. And there's all these things. Just by the way, I just want everybody to know that during the millennial reign, I will be commissioner of the NFL. I've been praying about it. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one who thought to ask ahead of time. And so... But we have to be ready for the kingdom. That's what Jesus is saying. You need to get ready for the kingdom. And Jesus says, I'm here... And because I'm here, the kingdom is coming. We're ready to establish the kingdom on earth. We're ready to reign. We're ready to give you the promise that the Old Testament prophets gave that, they, that someday Israel would be in the land and be blessed and that the people of God would dwell in the land and that they would reign over their enemies and there would be rest and there would be peace. And one day the lion and the lamb will lay down together and all of those wonderful things. For all you people out there, I'm talking to this people, all you people out there who are, you got all your big problems with Israel, don't you worry about it. Someday we will all be looking towards Israel because Jesus will be on the throne there and will be ruling the world for a thousand years. And by the way, since we're on that, we have messed up the world so much that even Jesus will have to have a thousand years to put it back the way it needs to be. 
That's how bad we've messed it up. Sorry I'm preaching too hard. That's not right. It says at one point God's going to take out our stony heart and put in a heart of flesh. And Jesus is saying the kingdom is here. It's waiting. It's imminent. He, sa- he uses this word. He says the kingdom is at hand. Which means it's the next thing that's going to happen. Now I know some think How could the kingdom be the next thing? How could it be at hand? How could Jesus say his kingdom is the next thing to happen? Well, first, the moment Jesus died and was risen from the dead, the kingdom of heaven was born. Because now people could get saved. And they could invite Jesus to come in their life and accept him as their Lord and Savior and accept him as the king of their life. So the kingdom of heaven was born the minute Jesus died and rose from the dead. That's a good word. Because while there may not be a literal physical kingdom right now, there is a spiritual kingdom that resides in each of us. Think about it. I was thinking this week, this is pretty cool. I know the Lord gave it to me because it's too cool for me to come up with. So I want you to think about this. See, it says we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which means we are the kingdom. So in this room today, we make up the kingdom of God. We're here. We are the kingdom of God. Now, every time someone becomes a Christian, the kingdom grows. I like to think of it this way. Jesus, in John chapter 14 and verse 2 says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And then how's he end it? I go to what? Prepare a place for you. So I was thinking about this as the kingdom grows. Every time someone comes to the Lord, the kingdom grows just a little bit because the kingdom resides in us. So every time someone gets saved, another mansion has to be built. I'm here to tell you today that every time somebody gives their heart to the Lord, the neighborhood gets a little bit bigger. So the kingdom of heaven is expanding every day. More mansions have to be added to the kingdom of... You get what I'm saying? So I looked this up because I want numbers. So I looked it up. Every day in the world... 64,000 people become believers in Jesus Christ every day. So every day, this is cool, every day the kingdom grows by 64,000 new mansions. Only North America and Europe are seeing a decline or stagnation in people coming to the Lord. Africa, Asia, people are coming to the Lord by the fa- well, 64,000 every day. 30,000 in Africa alone coming to the Lord every single day. So yes, the kingdom of heaven is expanding, but also here on earth, as new people are added every day, the spiritual kingdom of heaven is growing too. So every time someone heeds the message to repent, the kingdom grows as People, as more people are added to the kingdom, the closer we are to the literal kingdom. So here's the message for you today. And this is how I want to close us out before we take communion this morning. The message for us today is repent. Sometimes you got to just change directions. You're going the wrong way. You need to repent. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And here's the message I want you to get today in the church. Keep at it. Don't give up living your faith. We're almost there, church. I believe we're, we're almost there. I was watching TV last night, and the person we were watching was talking about how we're letting people run over us. And Christians, did you see they were burning Bibles this last week at one of the protests? A peaceful protest, we've got to burn Bibles. I looked over at Gloria last night as I was watching, and this person was speaking out against everything that she's seeing going on that's happening, that's happening, and she was speaking out, and I said, Gloria, when there's nobody left to speak out, that's when we know Jesus is really coming on his way. That's when we'll know Jesus 
is any second away from us. You just mark my words. All the nonsense that's happening in the world today, when people stop speaking out about it, that's when Jesus, we will know, you better get your ducks in a row because Jesus is on his way. When Christians stop speaking out, when there's no more voice left, Jesus will come. The only reason he hasn't come now is because there's 64,000 people every day giving their lives to the Lord. But let me just tell you something. The fact of the matter is, we're running out of people to get saved. And someday, the last of that number, that number, I believe over the next few years, we'll see that number shrink just a little bit because fewer and fewer people are willing to accept what God wants to do. And when that begins to happen, Someday, the last person who is willing to give their heart to the Lord will do it, and Jesus will come. So don't give up. You're almost there. We're on the last hill. We're ready to cross the river into glory land. Church, I feel a stirring that is happening that any day now, we will literally be living in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus' words are truer for us today than when he spoke them 2,000 years ago. The kingdom of heaven is the next thing. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Can you say amen to that, church? Bow your head and close your eyes. Father, I thank you for the word today that we know that you are coming. And I'm praying over my church today that if there is someone here today who's ready to give up, if there's someone here who's ready to throw in the towel, that, Lord, you would just remind them that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We're almost there. We're ready to cross the Jordan. We're ready to come into glory land. It's almost there. And I thank you, God, And you know, as we talked about repentance today, how many times have I needed, Lord, you know, to repent? And so today, as I stand in front of my people, I repent because I'm ready to take the communion. And I ask that if there's anything that's standing between me and God, me and you, and me and how I should be living, if there's anything that's hindering the kingdom of heaven in my soul, I ask that you would forgive me and and show me how to repent, how to change direction. And I thank you for that today. In Jesus' name we pray.